Hi, Tom. Do you want to do any testing or? Yes, I will do actually. Thanks. I'm just yeah, um, no having a, a little bit of a um, issue in that my um, taskbar seems to mask the microphone button. <laughs> Oh, I had this on a previous call as well. Um, um, and, and Carlos, do you have a presentation or no? Good evening. It's very late for you. Hello, Francis. Uh, yes, we will have a presentation, but my colleague, uh, Mohamed Kurban, will probably be the one sharing his screen. Okay, so, okay, good to know. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Hey, Nick. All right, um, okay. Um, let, let me, just bear with me one minute. Um, Okay. Um, do you want me to test my screen? Yep, yeah, you're more than welcome to. Um, okay, so if I just do share. Okay, I need, I need um, to get the control. I think well, somebody else is sharing at the moment. So. There we go. Excellent. Perfect. Can you see that okay? We can, yeah. Great. Excellent. Perfect. Okay. Do you have any videos or sound or anything? No, um, keeping it simple tonight. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> yeah, it's, it, it's, it's only a quick one, so. Okay, excellent. No, all good. Excellent, thank you. Hi, Francis, how are you? I'm fine. What about you? Sorry. Yeah, very good. Yeah. So. Hello, Nick. I'm Christine Dawson. Hi, Christine. Good to meet Great you. Great to meet you. Welcome. Welcome to the ICRI family. It's very Thank exciting. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Not, not yet. Not yet. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no. 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 We've been at enough meetings though over the. Not for assuming, of course. Thank you. Tom, do you know if uh, ECA Collaborative is uh, Kate? I think so. Yeah, it's me. Thanks. So, thank Sorry, you. I just thank changed you, my Kate. name. I, I, I could. Have, I could have asked you. Thank you.
Hello, everyone. This is Christine Dawson with the United States. Um, I want to welcome everyone. Um, good afternoon, good evening, good morning. Um, I know it is very, very late for many of you and quite early for a number of others of you. I have to say though, it's rather exciting to be on a virtual meeting when the sun is up. Uh, it's not something we in the Western hemisphere get very often. Uh, welcome again to everyone. It is so exciting to see so many longtime friends and so many um, new, new members, but also folks that, that I haven't met in person yet. It's, it's an honor to be back um, chairing ICRI. Um, I'm joined, I'm Christine Dawson with the US Department of State. I'm joined uh, with as my co-chair with Jen, Jennifer Koss of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric um, Administration. And of course, we couldn't do any of this without Francis Staub and Tom Dallison. Um, I want to welcome over 100 uh, ICRI enthusiasts who have registered for the meeting and um, want to begin our meeting right away again, recognizing it is very late for, for some of you. I do want to extend the apologies of Assistant Secretary Medina. At the very last minute, she was called to the White House for a meeting um, with our Deputy Secretary and, and the White House um, on COVID. So she was very disappointed and she hopes to be able to join us tomorrow. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to, to Jennifer and to begin, or to Francis, my apologies, to begin the agenda with our new member presentations. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. Good, good evening, good morning. Uh, just some few housekeeping, but as I'm sure by now, we all know how it does work. So this is a Zoom meeting. Uh, you are all on mute. When you want to talk, please raise your hand. Very simultaneous English, Spanish, French interpretation. Please speak slowly for to ease the interpretation. For the best quality experience, please use headset and microphone. The chat is only open to contact the secretary for technical issue. And we also encourage you to have your camera during the meeting since uh, it will be almost face to face. And just the last slide, like for interpretation, I'm sure you know all how it does work, but you can click on the little globe on the bottom right and choose your language. If you have any issue, again, please don't hesitate to contact us. <clears throat> okay, so as Christine said, we are going to, to start the session with the new members. So just a brief summary, like as of today, ICRI has 93 members, like about 44 countries, 17 international and regional organization, 29 NGO and three private companies. I think one thing important is to, to underline the fact that the 44 countries are custodian or 75% of the world coral reef. So I think this is very important. You can see on the map all the country and highlighted in yellow, in red are the funding country and just around there, there is Jamaica that we can't see, but Jamaica is one of the eight equi funding country. So today we are going to hear from three new members, new possible members. We also receive couple of other application, but it was received too late, so it will be considered for the next general meeting. So now I would like to welcome uh, the speaker from the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. So I'm not sure if it's ever uh, Duarte or uh, Dr. Kerban. I'm not very sure, but can you tell me please? And we'll make sure to give you like the host uh, capability so you'll be able to share your screen. Thank you.
Uh, hello. Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, Francis, how are you doing? Uh, I'm doing fine, Dr. Chauvin. What about you? Thank you. I'm fine. Thank you. Um, Welcome. Well, I would like to say uh, good morning or good evening, wherever you are right now. Um, and ladies and gentlemen, I'm happy to be here with you today. And uh, long time we don't meet, Francis. Uh, so I'm happy to see you again. I think I will uh, I will give the uh, information and talk about the Saudi Arabia and also my colleague, uh, Dr. Carlos, will give part of the talk. So both of us, we will talk uh, kindly, if you don't mind, please. So I'm, I'm ready whenever you are ready, please. The floor is yours. Okay, that will be fine. Um, just I need to know how to share because, yeah, okay, see, share screen. Okay, here we are. Are you able to see my screen? We are. If you can just put it in full screen, that would be perfect. I'll do so. Thank you very much. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Uh, just let me introduce myself first uh, to you guys. My name is uh, Dr. Mohamed Qurban. I'm a marine scientist and I'm the CEO of the National Center of Wildlife in Saudi Arabia. And here I'm uh, on behalf of the Ministry of Environment, Water and Agriculture in Saudi Arabia, and also on behalf of the Deputy Minister, Dr. Osama Faqiha, uh, who really apologized for not joining us today for something very important to join uh, with other business. So I will start talking about the, uh, the uh, regulations, uh, the, the, the uh, King's, uh, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia National Environment Strategy, I will also go to National Center for Wildlife, Coral, Coral Conservation in Saudi Arabia, and Saudi support and leadership in, in uh, Kordab. And uh, I will first uh, talk about the uh, Saudi Arabian National Environment Strategy Decree, uh, the vision and mission. So this is new uh, strategy we have in Saudi Arabia. The vision of this, uh, this uh, envir the national uh, environment strategy is the flourishing and uh, sustainable environment that benefits from the utmost care of everyone. The mission uh, really we work for to enable the concerned in, uh, uh, entities and to engage all stakeholders in order to develop and effectively implement policies, strategies, regulations, standards, and guidelines for protecting the environment and achieving sustainability. Uh, so the, the, uh, the, uh, the strategic expectation of uh, this, uh, uh, for the Saudi Arabian National Environment Strategy uh, to in the enhancement of the effectiveness of the sectors, uh, institutional uh, settings, governance, of operating model, regulations, economic sustainability of the sector, raise of the environmental compliance across all sectors and reduction in pollution and cause adverse impacts on the environment, development in the natural vegetation and combat of the desertification. Of course, the protection of wildlife and, and conservation of the biodiversity, promotion of private sector participation to ensure sector sustainability and drive of economic growth and innovation, uh, strengthening national capabilities in climate change adaptation, raise of environmental awareness and enhancement of NGOs and volunteer rules, and improvement of the quality and uh, the, the coverage of meteorological services. And from this one here, we have the sitting for the, for the uh, institutional sitting for the related to the national environment strategy, end up with having five national centers that really taking care of the environment and working for the environment in Saudi Arabia. Those centers are the National Center for Meteorology, National Center for Wildlife, and National Center for Vegetation Coverage and Combating Desertification, a National Center for Environmental Compliance, and National Center for Waste Management. That really linked and supported by the Environment Fund. And of course, we have for the first time, the Environmental Security Special Forces, and this is related to Ministry of Interior. So when I talk about the Environment Law Content Summary, we have now many chapters in this content, but in, in our case for coral reef, 
we are focusing on chapter four and chapter five, five, which talk about the marine and coastal environment, and the chapter five, which is the wildlife. When I come to the National Center for Wildlife, uh, we're going to talk about the centers involved uh, in the marine protection, all the centers involved in somehow in different ways, and focusing on the marine environment is the National Center for Wildlife. And here I'm going to talk about some more information about the vision and mission a statement of the National Center for Wildlife, the vision uh, which is focusing really on the flourishing and sustainable wildlife, biodiversity, and terrestrial and marine ecosystem. And the mission, of course, conserve and develop wildlife, biodiversity, and ecosystems through the promotion of community engagement in comprehensive and uh, comprehensive and effective uh, programs to achieve environmental sustainability and create social and economic value. So when I come to talk about the coral conservation in Saudi Arabia, I'll talk about the Saudi Arabia really as and many of you know, uh, has a rich natural asset in the form of highly uh, diverse coral reef, uh, especially in the northern part of Red Sea, as well as Arabian Gulf. The coral reefs in the, in the Red Sea and the Arabian Gulf are uh, ex ex exceptionally uh, heat resistant and provide a model to address the major challenge that most coral reef faces. And now even in, uh, in the research institute and, and research centers in, uh, in Kaos or in other, other schools in Saudi Arabia, we are really working in experimental work to, to uh, look at the genomes that really uh, uh, working with the heat resistant. Uh, Saudi Arabia has uh, almost 2,000 kilometer coastline along the Red Sea with highly developed reefs that uh, have historically had a very low impact. And coral reef represent a natural asset in terms of future tourism, uh, revenue, food from fisheries, biomedical compound and shoreline protection. And when I come to the contribution of the National Center of Wildlife, for the coral reef and the conservation special coral reef. We do work now with the reassessment of marine biodiversity hotspots area, assessment and monitoring of coral reef in the Arabian Gulf and Red Sea. And by the way, we have this monitoring for a long time for some areas um, like in the Arabian Gulf since 1984. Uh, rehabilitation of marine ecosystem, sustainable management and conservation of coastal areas environment, developing and establishing breeding and research centers, centers especially for coral nurses, nurses, developing the Farasan Island Biosphere Reserve as attractive uh, destination for wildlife. Here, I will uh, give the floor to my colleague, uh, Professor Carlos, to continue the, the talk. Uh, Professor Carlos, floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Mohammed. So, uh, the, the conservation of coral reefs has also been recently propelled through the expansion of Saudi Jika projects and particularly the Red Sea Group through a, mostly the Red Sea project. And Amala is a leader in regenerative tourism and is committed, committed with a 30% increase in conservation value, including improved status of coral reefs through resilience uh, management, monitoring, and where needed restoration and NEOM, which is a large project in the Northern Red Sea, is uh, becoming a leader in coral gardening. And he has initiated this year in partnership with uh, King Abdullah University of Science and Technology, the largest coral expansion project in the world that aims at establishing four square kilometers of coral uh, by 2026, supported by the largest coral nursery plant in the world. Uh, if you can move to the next slide, Dr. Mohammed, kindly. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah. So uh, also, some institutions are leading the way in multiple areas of coral reef research that includes coral genomics, forecasting future heat waves and coral responses to those events, coral probiotics, 3D printing in aid of coral restoration, understanding the basis of, of uh, 
genetic uh, thermal resilience of corals, marine spatial planning for coral conservation, coral metabolism, restoration technologies, coral reef biodiversity, and also monitoring of coral reefs in the Arabian Gulf and Red Sea. And lastly, uh, uh, then uh, we would like to highlight the uh, support and leadership that uh, the kingdom has uh, uh, given to establishing CORDAP, that is the Coral Research and Development Accelerator Platform that was uh, decided by the G20 members during the Saudi presidency in 2020. And this is a new G20 initiative where the uh, members agreed to establish a global coral reef research and development accelerator platform to bring together the best scientific minds from all around the world to scale up next generation science and technology solutions for coral conservation and restoration. The goal is to secure a future for tropical and cold water coral reefs by unifying the best minds around a research, a targeted research project. The platform uh, uh, came to life on uh, June this year. And uh, now we, this week, in fact, uh, two days from now, the scientific and advisory uh, committee will be established. ICRI is a member of the initiative governance uh, committee. And then the operations of the CORDAP are supported by King Abdullah University of Science and Technology uh, at no cost to the, to the platform where the resources will be all used to uh, implement the, the research program. So this is all from my side. Thank you. Okay, th thank you, gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, I think this is the end of the talk. Floor, floor is yours, uh, Francis. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, just to, to let everybody know that CORDAP so will be presented in more details on Wednesday. So we'll have a 15 minute presentation about CORDAP. So, so that will be very useful. So thank you. And now I would like to, to hear from uh, Nick Hardman Montfort from the Head of Ocean and Natural Resources for the Conway Secretariat. Nick, the floor is yours. Thank you, Francis. Uh, I'm just going to share my screen here. Can everybody see that OK? We can, thank you. Fantastic. Okay. So, um, good evening, morning, um, afternoon, wherever you may be, excellencies, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. It is my pleasure to bring the greetings, first of all, of the Commonwealth Secretary General to this 36th ICRI General Meeting. And I'm grateful to you for providing us with the opportunity to share briefly the Commonwealth's work on coral reefs through the Commonwealth Blue Charter and its action group on coral reef protection and restoration. The Commonwealth's been developing strong ties with ICRI over the past three years uh, since the adoption of the Commonwealth Blue Charter through, and, and we've been doing this through collaboration at key in-person and virtual events, engagement of our coral member states and our joint goal of protecting and restoring these key ecosystems. So I'm just gonna share a bit more with you about this uh, in the presentation. So first of all, just um, for those of you um, who, who are less familiar with the Commonwealth, I thought I'd say, what is the Commonwealth? It's 54 countries. Um, comprising a third of the world's population and a fifth of its land area. And we're joined together through a common bond, not a shared history as some think, but actually our principles and values as established in the Charter of the Commonwealth. So as stated in the founding London Declaration in 1949, we are an association of free and equal members, freely cooperating in the pursuit of peace, liberty and progress. This is why our membership includes a mix of English speaking, Francophone and Lusophone countries, including those with no historical ties to Britain, such as Rwanda and Mozambique. But it is also largely an ocean Commonwealth. 47 of our 54 member countries have a coastline and all of us depend on the ocean. Over a third of national waters globally are in Commonwealth jurisdictions. And this includes 25, that is two thirds of the world's small island developing states, or better described as large ocean states. Overall, there's 20 times more ocean than land in Commonwealth SIDS. And in some countries, this is thousands of times more, 4,000 times 
greater in Kiribati, 3,000 in the Maldives and Seychelles. Significantly as well, um, Commonwealth countries are stewards of nearly half of the warm water coral reefs um, globally. About 45% of, of warm water coral reefs are in Commonwealth jurisdictions. So three and a half years ago, recognizing the increased urgency of ocean issues, Commonwealth heads of government agreed that ocean challenges cannot be solved alone, but that we must join forces in common purpose uh, while taking an approach that respects our principles and values. And they captured this commitment through the Commonwealth Blue Charter. It provides Commonwealth countries a voice and the platform to work together on the formation of a fair, inclusive and sustainable approach to ocean protection and sustainable economic development. What makes the Blue Charter different from many other multilateral environmental agreements is that it focuses on how countries will organize to meet existing national and international commitments, such as those under SDG 14, and do so by working together. The Commonwealth Blue Charter's implementation mechanism is through a set of country-led action groups, each devoted to a particular ocean issue. And 46 of the Commonwealth's 54 countries have already joined one or more of these 10 action groups. The action groups provide a focal point for member countries to engage with each other and with partners from a range of sectors such as NGOs, academia, philanthropy, industry and finance, to share challenges and identify solutions together. So really, they can be open to any group willing to get involved. And that includes non-Commonwealth countries that want to partner with Commonwealth countries in these actions. I wish I had time to tell you more about the exciting partnerships we have underway, actually, such as with the Allen Coral Atlas, but that will have to wait for another opportunity. But I have included further slides in this slide deck for you to browse through later um, to have a look at these and also share some case studies to highlight the great work we're doing. The action groups are supported by the Secretariat, the Commonwealth Secretariat, in a variety of ways, including convening meetings, webinars, training, and capacity building. And as we move into phase two of the Blue Charter in project development and securing financing for those projects. So these are the 10 action groups. Um, to date, 16 countries have stepped forward to champion or co-champion the 10 action groups. And the action groups were chosen by countries to reflect their most pressing priorities. They cover a range of topics, so mangroves, climate, blue economy, ocean observations, coastal fisheries, MPAs, and so on. Um, and Australia, Belize, and Mauritius co-championed the action group on coral reef protection and restoration, which is key to our relationship with ICRI. The action group has eight members and focuses on the protection and restoration of coral reefs by promoting policies and techniques that confer reef resilience and by developing and implementing coral reef restoration methods that can be applied at scale, engage community participation and enhance livelihood benefits. Partnering with ICRI has been a key focus over the past three years with Australia in the chair of ICRI uh, along with um, uh, Monaco and Indonesia. Um, and, and so Australia also at the same time stepped forward to champion the action group and highlighted the alignment between the two initiatives. So after consultation and consideration, the Commonwealth Secretariat as an intergovernmental organization has applied, has applied to formalize this partnership by becoming a full member of ICRI. The Commonwealth Secretariat commits to support the goals and objectives of ICRI in as much as they align with those of the principles of the Commonwealth as expressed in its charter and through the Commonwealth Blue Charter, and to do this by supporting collective and coordinated action addressing challenges related to corals, noting that 19 ICRI members are also champions or members of a Commonwealth Blue Charter action group. By working with ICRI and its ad hoc committees to develop research, policy, knowledge sharing and educational opportunities, by communicating about threats to coral reefs and actions being taken to tackle these threats and providing expertise to assist in developing and reviewing policies. And also by supporting the work being undertaken by the Global Coral Reef Monitoring Network, providing a platform for more Commonwealth countries to continue to this mapping and monitoring. So um, given the time we've got tonight I'll, i will leave it there there's much more i could say about the blue charter but um please do get in touch if you'd like to know more there's also lots of, of information on our website you can follow us on social media 
Um, I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nick. So now I would like to invite the, the first speaker for the new member uh, section. So this is Robert Glaser from the Gulf and Caribbean Fishery Institute. Robert, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Francis. Uh, I appreciate it. It's good uh, to be here with you all uh, this morning, this evening, and this afternoon. Uh, my name is Bob Glazer. I'm going to do this a little differently without a presentation because I thought I'd like to engage you directly. Um, uh, and so let me just begin by saying that I am the executive director of the Gulf and Caribbean Fisheries Institute or GCFI. I am hoping that after you hear about our organization, you'll recognize the value we can bring to ICRI and will consider favorably our application for membership. First, I'd like to provide you with some information about GCFI. GCFI was founded in 1948 by the University of Miami. The goal of GCFI at that time was to help identify underexploited marine resources and identify ways to ensure their full exploitation. In the mid 1980s, as part of a series of austerity measures by the University of Miami, GCFI was eliminated from their budget. Um, and in response, GCFI was spun off into a US registered 501c3 nonprofit corporation. At the same time, the mission of GCFI pivoted to one more focused on conservation and sustainable use of the region's marine resources rather than exploitation. Our membership now includes individuals and organizations from more than 40 countries and territories. In those early days, GCFI focused on two principal activities, an annual institute and publication of the proceedings originating from those institutes. GCFI continues to convene an annual institute somewhere in the region and publish the proceedings, we now bring together approximately 400 scientists, managers, students, fishers, members of civil society, private corporations, and other marine resource stakeholders. Through it all, GCFI has remained committed to our core principle of impartiality. We do not take positions. Rather, we bring together disparate members of society to form partnerships and alliances. We still continue to publish the proceedings of the annual institute, which likely represents the longest running record of scientific research and management on marine resources in the region. As part of our commitment to freely disseminating information, all the papers published in the proceedings are free to members and non-members alike. Yet now GCFI has become so much more than just a conference and proceedings. Beginning in the early 2000s, we began focusing more of our efforts on developing partnerships with the idea of providing capacity for achieving effective marine conservation. I would like to highlight a few of these activities and initiatives. In all cases, we believe that they align well with the mission of ICRI. First, GCFI has worked uh, has worked approximately, um, one second please, um, two decades on developing marine protected area networks in the region and facilitating building capacity among MPA managers. In 2004, GCFI partnered with UNEP Cartagena Convention at the Whitewater to Blue Water Partnership Conference to help relaunch the Caribbean Marine Protected Area Managers Network and Forum or CAMPAM as many of you are probably familiar with. As a direct result of this activity, GCFI together with NOAA's uh, Coral Reef Conservation Program developed and implemented a new regional MPA network focused on coral reef associated MPAs. This network, MPA Connect, is built on and based upon the self-identified needs of MPA managers. Based on these self-evaluations, the MPA capacity building activities focus on sustainable financing, coral reef ecosystem resource monitoring, development of sustainable fisheries approaches, effective communication with and among stakeholders, MPA management plan development and other areas of focus. Together, CAMPAM and MPA Connect represent synergistic activities, both focused on developing capacity for MPA managers. MPA Connect is currently supported by contributions from NOAA, USAID, and CAMPAM is funded by UNEP Cartagena Convention SPA protocol. I would like to point out a recent publication was built off of our MPA Connect work and which focused on best practices related to the management and control of stony coral tissue loss disease in the Caribbean. This publication was released in October 2021 and can be found on our website as well as the website of UNEP-SEP. GCFI continues to facilitate activities related to stony coral tissue loss disease. I would now like to briefly highlight our Fisheries for Fishers initiative. This activity focuses on empowering artisanal fishers to practice good stewardship of the resources they exploit. One component of the initiative is the Gladding Memorial Award, which identifies and annually recognizes a fisher has demonstrated through their action, actions a lifelong commitment to conservation. 
To date, we have approximately 25 fishers from throughout the Caribbean and Gulf of Mexico region who exemplify this ethic. This initiative also provides activities that unite fishers and coral conservation. Many of these fishers are provided scholarships to attend our annual meetings so they can interact with other stakeholders. GCFI recently has entered into a partnership with UNEP's Global Partnership on Marine Litter. Together with the UNEP Caribbean Environment Program, GCFI now serves as the co-host for the Caribbean node of the Global Partnership on Marine Litter, on Marine Litter otherwise known as GPML Carib. In this capacity, we are focusing substantial efforts on the reduction of marine litter, including providing alternatives to single-use plastics. More recently, we are working with funding from Canada's Department of Fisheries and Oceans and leveraging the fisher conservationists to help implement these efforts. I would like to also introduce our student initiative. GCFI and our partners support scholarships for students whose activities, including research, focus on areas that address our mission and the missions of our partners. Uh, this initiative is supported by generous contributions from Sea Grant, Heart Research Institute, and Society for the Conservation of Reef Fish Aggregations. Finally, I was notified today, today that GCFI will be provided funding from the Convention on the International Trade in Endangered Species of Wild Flora and Flora, Fauna and Flora, or CITES, to facilitate activities related to ensuring the sustainable trade in Queen Conch, a regionally important fisheries, as Queen Conch is listed in Appendix 2 of CITES. I would briefly like to highlight a few other activities uh, upon which GCFI has focused. In 2020, GCFI published results of our in-house research entitled Science and Research Serving Effective Ocean Governance in the Wider Caribbean Region. This report detailed the research priorities at the nexus of governance and science by examining three regional fisheries, healthy ecosystems, and reduction of pollution. The priorities of each of these focal areas were identified based upon gaps in science, monitoring, governance, communications, and socioeconomics. The pro program was funded under the Caribbean and North Brazil Shelf Large Marine Ecosystem GEF Project, CLME+. Here are a few other highlights which may be of interest to ICRI. GCFI, GCFI has served as the host of the NOAA Regional Invasive Lionfish Web Portal and published the Guide to Invasive Lionfish Control and Management, which can be found on the ICRI website. GCFI has also published numerous outreach materials related to, for example, the sargassum influx in the Caribbean, marine litter, and materials for fishers and co-ops related to the reduction of abandoned, lost, dis and discarded fishing gear. I hope this brief overview provides some flavor on the activities that GCFI has and continues to participate in. We believe that uh, they are consistent with the priorities of ICRI and its partner countries and organizations. Uh, we hope you will consider this application for membership and look forward to your response. Thank you. Thank you all three. Um, very exciting activities going on. Colleagues, you have heard three very compelling applications. Uh, if you have an objection to any of these, please raise your hand. Of course, you have to hit the hand button. Normally I would say hearing, no objection. Seeing no objection, please join me in welcoming our new ICRI members. It's very exciting. Thank you again, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, the Commonwealth Secretariat, and Gulf and Caribbean Fisheries Institute. We think you'll make wonderful ICRI, ICRI members, and we welcome you to the family. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. That's very kind. So now we would like to come to introducing our proposed plan of action. The United States is very pleased to offer an ICRI plan of action outlining the work we would like to accomplish over the next three years. As we saw with the amazingly successful Australia, Monaco, Indonesia Secretariat, we believe three years provides more stability as well as a greater opportunity to really drill down into some of our collective objectives. We tried to frame the plan, this plan of action as an overarching framework under which we as the Secretariat are committed to working on specific thematic areas. While we have included some illustrative activities, we purposely did not include a lot of detail. We hope during our discussion here and as we work together over the next three years, we can expand upon these themes. We welcome 
additional specific ideas, particularly on what we might work on as a collective. We, of course, look to ICRI members to continue their own work um, and their work within smaller groups and trust that if some, if not all of the work they do fit within these themes. As in the past, we believe the plan should be an iterative process. This is not carved in stone. We hope all ICRI members can find a home under these themes for their work and the work they're doing with others. So by way of a general introduction to the plan, which you have all had and, and read, we're interested in exploring opportunities to co increase collaboration. ICRI remains a partnership of the willing and committed in service to coral reef ecosystem resilience. Our proposed plan of action is dedicated to the notion that all ICRI members are committed to the future, to leaving our grandchildren and their grandchildren a healthy and vibrant planet, reflected in restored, thriving, and absolutely dazzling coral reefs. Under a plan of action, the United States to, commits to acting now to promote coral reef resilience, build capacity, advance and utilize new technology and science, reduce local threats, and reach beyond our current membership, and especially to collaborate with and listen to indigenous peoples, local communities, and youth. As we view this very much of, as an iterative process, it was not our intention to negotiate specific edicts uh, during our time together because it's very, very short. Um, rather, we believe it would be very useful though to have an exchange of views now, particularly on the overall framing. For those of you who have submitted written comments already, thank you so much. Um, perhaps we could have a slide about, I think it might already be there. Yes, of those um, from who have already committed, but we invite and encourage all ECRI members to share their thoughts and ask that you send them to us via an email. With that brief introduction, I'd like to open the floor. Please raise your hand if you would like to take the floor and we welcome, again, encourage hearing from you because this is a team effort and, and we, need, we need ideas and we need to take action. So, and I, I'm not seeing anyone. All right, so what I'm going to do, seeing as how we seem to have a very reluctant group, and I know I, what I failed to say at the beginning is, I know we're all very much looking forward to being together again, where we can have not only an exchange during the sit down part of the meeting, but really expand on our, our efforts by all those one on one or small groups that huddle um, after or before over coffee, over drinks, and, and usually out on the sand um, in warmer weather than we have right now in Washington, DC. All right, uh, such a shy group. Um, might I ask Japan to pick us to, to kick off and just let us know, let everyone know what you sent in. There, there were some very, um, very, very good ideas and I think easily done. Uh, Tadashi, I saw you on here. <laughs> Yes. <clears throat> can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Christ uh, <clears throat> Christine. Um, yes, thank you very much for organizing the plan of action. It's a really good one. And uh, I have just one comment on the uh, uh, page five on uh, illustrative activities. So the plan of action mentioned the digital remain intends to establish task force of experts of develop uh, guidelines and protocol that can be implemented across the network to build capacity and capacity in 
core monitoring, data collection, analysis, management, and sharing. So um, we are going to build a capacity in core monitoring, but I like to add uh, other ecosystem like mangroves and seagrass bed. So uh, when we have a, a workshop, a regional workshop in East Asia for the Global Coral Monitoring Network, uh, we have some friends from uh, mangrove uh, scientists and also seagrass scientists. They are very interested in to work together with the coral reef scientists. So I think uh, this uh, activity uh, might include uh, other ecosystems uh, monitoring and also data collection analysis and management and sharing. So um, I like to uh, propose the uh, this sentence change to the uh, not only the coral but uh, coral reef and related ecosystems. So that is my comments on uh, this plan of action. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tadashi san. And yes, I think um, there's great interest. And I, I know in the past, we have very much embraced uh, mangroves and, and further back and, as well as seagrass beds. So, so I hope um, the membership will be interested in undertaking that. I think that's a very good suggestion. So again, very shy group. Maybe it's the timing. You know, it, it could be that. Um, how about WCS? Hello, Alfred. Could you give us in not the specific ideas, but just in general, your, your thoughts um, on it as a conceptual matter rather than a specific edits? I'm very happy to see Canada has raised. You'll be next. We thought it was, thanks, um, uh, thank you, Chair. We thought it was an excellent plan of action. And I think, uh, you know, without going into specifics, we thought it would really benefit from uh, recognizing the two challenges identified of biodiversity loss and climate change. ICRI is really well placed to help guide um, or help inform or help uh, bring together stakeholders that work at the nexus of uh, biodiversity and climate to think about how to align national and subnational strategies in that regard. So we thought it'd be really useful to talk about different um, interventions that, that may be useful, but also different monitoring strategies to look at the status of biodiversity and how we can um, monitor the success or impact of our interventions. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Good to see. Canada, Jason? Uh, yes, hi, hi everyone. Thanks so much uh, for allowing me to take the floor. Uh, and I'll, I'll just introduce myself. I'm, I'm new to, to this forum. So my name is Jason Van Weingarten. I work with Environment and Climate Change Canada. Um, and I, I'm also joined on the call with uh, by some colleagues uh, with Fisheries and Oceans Canada as well. But um, not too many comments to share. Uh, I guess, first of all, welcome to the United States in, in taking on this role. And thank you so much uh, for, for putting together this plan of action. I think the themes um, that you've outlined are, are quite good. And I think you know, give a lot of room for, for all of us to kind of advance priorities together. Um, I guess, you know, from Canada's perspective, and not a surprise, you know, we are obviously, you know, very interested in advancing the, the role, the participation, the leadership of Indigenous peoples. So I think, you know, we were quite pleased to see a specific uh, section focusing there and particularly recognizing the importance of um, the rights of knowledge holders uh, in advancing this sort of action. So just, I just wanted to, you know, express support for, for that. Um, Kind of element and particularly including some activities in that regard uh, and in, uh, kind of in line with that just also wanted to, to suggest that you know we also really keep in mind the importance of including uh, indigenous leadership and participation and perspectives and knowledge uh, throughout the activities that are advanced over the next three years so you know great to have um, specific workshops or forums that um, are specifically geared towards their participation but also i think really important to ensure their voices are heard across all of our activities um, through ICRI. Um, and then just also wanted to the quisiera decir también que the important role of the private sector. I know we have a, a number of private sector uh, members of ICRI, but uh, um, Canada, you know, we're quite interested in, in sort of the role of private sector, both in helping to scale finance and sort of looking at innovative finance solutions to help us advance the, the, the conservation and the restoration of coral reefs. So 
Um, you may have heard Canada recently announced some more funding for the Ocean Risk and Resilience Action Alliance and uh, new funding for the Global Fund for Coral Reefs. So really kind of keen to continue collaborating with others and in those sorts of initiatives, but also recognizing sort of under the theme about observation and sort of technologies and technological approaches, the role that uh, private sector can play in bringing some of those technological solutions uh, to kind of a, to support these efforts as well. So just a couple of thoughts from our perspective. Uh, thanks again for, for letting me take the floor and look forward to the continued discussion. No, thank you. Thank you very much for those. And we will certainly be in touch. Uh, the US and Canada have worked a, a lot together in a number of different forum on, on Indigenous rights and, and local communities because often they're left out as well. So we look very much forward to um, working with you and others to find the ways and, and completely agree. It's across the board. It's not in its own little idea, but we wanted to highlight that and um, and also certainly agree on the bringing in the private sector because there's there's much work they can that much value they have brought and they can bring going forward. So thank you again. ICRS, Andrea, hello. Hi, thank you for having me. And um, one of the things ICRS brought up that we um, communicated with it create was that we thought the plan of action should include uh, an action to develop a report or set of recommendations on how coral reefs can be best addressed in future UNFCCC party nationally determined contributions, specifically how coral reefs uh, protect coastlines and provide physical barriers, that that was missing from this report and perhaps an ad hoc committee would be needed um, to address that. So that was the formal submission by ICRS. Um, separately though, I have received other feedback since then from other ICRS members asking why climate change and specific actions related to climate change are not addressed explicitly in this plan of action. I can answer your second on that we have referenced climate and that we did not go into the specifics. Um, it would have been pages and pages long if, if we were to take on all of the specific actions. So we just brought up illustrative ones that we assumed every people might not have thought of and that there are very specific ones um, that could come later. Uh, so that that was that. Uh, I would note, um, and then I'd like to call on Jen because she may have some additional comments uh, in response to yours. That that um, under the French plan of action, there was actually quite a bit of work done on um, NDCs, and so we we'd like to go back and review that before we set up another ad hoc committee to so that we don't duplicate what was already done because we think many took on board a lot of the great suggestions that that came out of that so jen are you responding to andrea thank you i am thank you um and as chris said we didn't explicitly go into every um, part of, of what we thought was important to address in this session of, of ICRI, but we would note that um, through the promotion of resilience-based management, that's where climate change comes in, as it merges um, traditional ways that we've been thinking about restoring and improving coral reefs with the eye towards what climate change will be delivering to coral reefs in the future, including the work to reduce those um, greenhouse gas emissions. So it will be well covered there. Um, apologies if people didn't see it in that resilience-based management section, but that's certainly where it will land. When you do a, con a control find for climate change in the document, there are no mentions of the word climate and the word change together. I'm sure we can address that. Thank you. Yeah. And under the Biden administration, we referred to it as the climate crisis, and you did see that in the document. So, so Nick, thank you. Please jump in. Uh, well, thank you. And um, as, as the newest member to speak so far on, on, on this work plan, um, you know, it's really exciting to be joining at the time of a new work plan getting underway and to see all, all, all the, the, you know, the ideas there. Um, I feel they really align well with what we do in the Commonwealth Secretariat. Um, 
there's lots of areas for um, both the Secretariat and Commonwealth countries to contribute um, as part of the Blue Charter program and, and, and the alignment between the Blue Charter program and the New Work program. Um, notably, in relation to policies and frameworks, um, we have a, a, a decades of, of experience in developing um, ocean uh, policy frameworks and um, legal guidance to countries. So um, we're definitely sort of interested in supporting that along with capacity building um, and supporting the uptake of science into policy. Um, uh, I completely echo Canada's strong sentiment for the diversity and inclusion theme. I think this is excellent. It is, um, we have a very strong youth and gender focus within the um, Blue Charter and we have been um, working to strengthen our, our Indigenous um, peoples engagement. Bearing in mind, we have a very strong representation of Indigenous peoples across the Commonwealth and, and a lot of Indigenous knowledge to bring forward on that. And Canada, as, as the champions on ocean observation in the Commonwealth Blue Charter, um, have also been sort of promoting the, these uh, the diversity aspects to marine science. Uh, they did a very good report I could direct you to on um, uh, gender uh, on, on sort of women in marine science, basically, and um, how, how to improve inclusion there. Um, so that's available on our website. Um, and so um, I just had one question is, is that the, these sort of outcomes are laid out, but um, I'm wondering if there's a plan to develop this more into a logical framework or to, to get a, a, a mal plan to get a, a uh, monitoring environmental and learning framework to track the progress um, towards outcomes, get some indicators in place so we can really demonstrate the progress made on this over the three years. Okay. Well, <laughs> indicators and metrics. It's a very interesting concept and I'd like to have a, a conversation with folks. I think there are a lot out there. Um, I come from, of course, a, a diplomatic perspective and in a in a partnership it's a little more challenging we're, we're not um, happily we're we're definitely not a legally binding agreement we're not a forum that that people um, necessarily take on commitments again it is the it is a partnership of the willing um, and it's certainly an, an interesting idea, and I think I'd like to take it back. And if others have views on that, it would be very helpful to those of us that, that are, are refining, because again, this is not going to be um, carved in stone. This is gonna be iterative throughout, throughout our time as chair, and we'd like to have a conversation about that. Um, I know that's something my USAID colleagues and uh, my colleagues at NOAA are very, very good at. Us diplomats, it's a little squishier. Um, and I was very excited to see among your slides a slide about your efforts in South Africa with, with women. So that was very exciting. Um, and one of the reasons, too, that, that we very specifically included local communities um, is because particularly in Africa, but in other regions as well, not everyone identifies themselves in the Pacific Islands, identify themselves as an indigenous group, but they are a very key, important local community that have lived there and they've handed down things. Um, and the other is we will be very, very careful not to, we welcome uh, indigenous knowledge, but nothing will be, be used without the very explicit agreement from the knowledge holders that this is knowledge they have given freely and wish to share with the great and the world. Um, it's a very, very important concept that I know you share. Australia shares a number of us that work closely on these issues. So thank you. Um, those are great ideas, great ideas. We have... I have a question. When would we like the comments? Um, I would say, um, well, we are, we are entering an, an <laughs> a period where a lot of folks are off for varying and different holidays. So, so perhaps um, I'm looking at my calendars. By the end of the first week of January, but 
but again, you know, just for this first set, and then we'll we'll take them on board. Um, I did I did notice that several comments came back about uh, our use in one of the the preambular paragraphs of well not preambular oh my goodness to negotiate in some of the initial paragraphs of of the use of the word coral reefs gifts to humans. Um, Yes, in many places they are referred to as services or ecosystem services uh, in the intergovernmental platform on biodiversity and ecosystem services. We had a wonderfully long and rich discussion. Um, the indigenous representatives suggested that we use the term gifts because they are freely given. Uh, and it, it was an interesting back and forth with the more rich, some of the more rigid scientific community. Um, and we ended up with contributions um, in, in recognition of, I think, the work and particularly under the, the Biden administration and our outreach to, to our Native Americans and to other indigenous groups that um, we would like to see if we could use the word gifts because we really do believe that it, um, it symbolizes and says more. But please do share your views on that as well, because we're not completely wedded to it. We really like it, but again, uh, it's just a different way. And I, I think this is something that's a very exciting time that we are trying to re-examine our relationship with nature. And in doing so, talking about nature in a different way and that's one of the ways that, that we are actually trying to do it in the US. So again, ah, I'm told that uh, we are supposed to be taking a break. <laughs> I just saw this flash in front of me. Anyway, again, um, please don't be shy. Definitely send us your thoughts and ideas, comment on what other folks have said. And, you know, don't, don't worry, I mean, we'd like them in early January, but we wanna have this as a continuing conversation. So with that, um, I'd like to ask that we take a, a short break and come back at, well, by my clock, it would be 510. Cause I am mindful that some folks are up very, very late and I wanna make sure we have time for our presentations um, after this. So if you could come back at whatever hour it is at 10 minutes past the hour, that would be wonderful. Thank you.
Hello, hopefully everybody is back from break. We're ready to go on to the next agenda item. And that is um, the topic of the Global Coral Reef Monitoring Network. Earlier this year, the report on the status of coral reefs the world was released. It was the first global status report in 13 years. The data acquisition and homogenization stage was completed in April of 2020 with the acquisition of over 200 data sets from 75 countries, these data sets included more than 1.75 million observations of 23 different variables recorded from more than 100,000 transects. So that's just a little bit of a teaser, what I'm sure David's going to cover in a minute here. Um, NOAA will be the new chair of the steering committee. However, Ames has graciously um, decided that they will still host the institution of GCRMN. And with that, I congratulate the amazing Dr. David Suter and the many GCRM and steering committee members across all of the nodes for their Herculean efforts to produce such a wonderful new resource that informs the global understanding of the status of the world's reefs. So with that, take it away, David Suter. Thanks, Jen. Thanks for the kind words. And I will firstly say that it was not only me, but many, many hundreds of people who were involved in producing this report. I just had the, um, the privilege actually of, of herding all of those cats into a, a coherent document. Uh, I would just like to share my screen. I think Francis, you'll have to share, stop sharing. Can everyone see that in presenter mode or is that, do you have my notes? Nope, looks good. Looks good, excellent. Mm -hmm. All right, thanks, Jen. Um, I'll just reiterate, uh, my name's David Suda. I'm the global coordinator of the GCRMN and I'm based at the Australian Institute of Marine Science in, in Townsville in Australia. And uh, just to reiterate Christine's earlier statement, it is a remarkable thing to be able to do this during daylight hours from Australia. However, I would um, definitely like to acknowledge the commitment of those of you who are in the sort of middle longitudes where it must almost be midnight uh, or the early hours of the morning. So genuinely impressive commitment to ICRI and, and the GCRMN. Uh, in recognition of the new theme four in the plan of action, I too would like to acknowledge the Indigenous peoples and the traditional owners on the lands and seas with which we're meeting from. And I'd like to also acknowledge their enduring connections to those lands and seas and their, acknowledge their elders past, present and future. Many of you will have heard parts of this presentation uh at least the the results sections and um i felt that well someone once told me that repetition was the mother of all learning uh so it probably is worth just quickly running through the major results of the report before i do that though i do want to acknowledge the enormous amount of effort that people put into this report we had contributions from more than 300 scientists and organizations which which jen alluded to at the beginning um, i'd like to also acknowledge the efforts of my co-editors uh, several of whom are on the in this meeting um, particularly francis uh, serge plan who'll talk in a in a few minutes jeremy vicart David Obura, uh, Murray Logan, and uh, a lot of hours put into the report, which I um, think you all appreciate. I'd also like to acknowledge the regional coordinators who, who corralled data and made sure that the, uh, the report was a success from a, from a data collation point of view, and also the uh, production of the regional chapters in terms of funding, we were very, very lucky to receive a million Australian dollars from the Australian government through the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. Uh, we received significant support from the Principality of Monaco, the Government of Sweden and the United Nations Environment Programme. 
Um, I'd also like to thank the members of ICRI. Um, ICRI obviously is the parent body to the Global Coral Reef Monitoring Network and particularly the co-chairs uh, of the immediate past Secretariat, Australia, Monaco and Indonesia. And I must say, I'm very much looking forward to building a very strong relationship with the incoming US Secretariat, Jen and Christine. And finally, the Australian Institute of Marine Science, who has provided significant support to, to myself and the broader GCRMN. So as Jen mentioned in her introduction, almost 2 million observations collected over 41 years from 1978 to 2019, 12,000 sites and 73 countries. It was a substantial data set and a substantial contribution by the broader um, global coral reef monitoring network and community. This is the benefit of being able to accumulate such a significant data set. We can produce a estimate of global average coral cover of all reefs um, from which we receive data around the world. And looking at this graph, you can see a number of distinct phases over the last 40 years. Prior to the 1998 bleaching event, global coral cover was quite high and it was very stable. Um, but also because data were relatively scarce and also sparse, the uncertainty in that global average estimate of global average coral cover was also quite high. Then in 1998, we had the first ever global mass bleaching event and basically two things happened. The first was the global coral reef monitoring community mobilized and the number of surveys conducted to measure the impacts of that bleaching event increased enormously. The second thing that happened as a consequence of those, bleach, of those surveys, and we saw that as a consequence of the 98 bleaching event, we lost 8% of the world's coral um, on the world's reefs essentially through that one single event. However, during the next decade, in the absence of major disturbances, we saw global average coral cover recover to, to uh, pre-98 bleaching levels. But since then, it's been a fairly sad story. So in 2010 and then in 2016, we had the second and third global average or global coral bleaching events. And as a consequence of those two events, plus also a wide range of local impacts such as Cranathorn starfish outbreaks, coral diseases, poor water quality, et cetera, we saw the loss of about 14% of the, of the coral um, on the world's coral reefs. This is a significant decline. However, perhaps it's not all bad news. In 2019, we saw the first evidence of perhaps some recovery. And perhaps if you were optimistic, you might think that this might be the first evidence of, of adaptation. So let's hope that that turns out to be true. The next major result, uh, these two graphs, which essentially is the, um, the global trends in uh, the cover of algae and also how this compares with with coral so the bottom figure is the coral algal ratio similar sort of story the, although the inverse of coral in the beginning um, up to about 2011 we saw the cover of algae uh, was relatively low and also stable and during that period, we saw approximately twice as much coral on the world's reefs as we did algae. However, during the last decade, we've seen a significant increase in the amount of algae on the world's reefs. In fact, an increase of about 20%. And we've seen a concomitant decline in the ratio between coral and algae. So there's now roughly only about one and a half times as much coral on the world's reefs as there is algae. And this no doubt is um, having some impact on the, on the ecosystem services or gifts as we've just been discussing that we're receiving from, from coral reefs. The last kind of, or the second last kind of technical slide I wanted to, to show is that 
we examined in this process the relationship between sea surface temperature and anomaly over the last 40 years and the global average coral cover. And what we see is there's actually a very, very strong association between these, these two metrics. Each of the three major global bleaching events corresponds to periods where there has been very, very rapid um, sea surface temperature increases, particularly when sea surface the sea surface temperature anomaly exceeds this magic uh, uh, line here, which is 0.45 essentially. The second element um, that we see is where we've had protracted sea surface temperature increases, particularly in the last decade. And this is fairly obvious um, or fairly strong indication of the impacts of, of climate change. And you'd suggest also that these protracted um, periods of high sea surface temperatures has also hindered the, the recovery of the world's coral reefs. Finally, again, back to the 2019, is that the first evidence of, of recovery? I can tell you that on the Great Barrier Reef, at least um, coral cover has been recovering in the last few years in the absence of disturbance. And, and this is a very, very important message in that many of the world's reefs remain resilient. And so that if we can remove the pressures from the world's reefs, um, whether it be climate change or whether it be more local factors, reefs have or retain the natural ability to recover. So resilience is key. We must remain resilient of reefs going forwards. Just finally, before I get into the sort of lessons learned from producing this particular report, I just wanted to cover off quickly on some of the regional pictures. Now, I don't expect you to be able to look at each and every little graph here. Um, I will note that the, because of the variation in coral cover between the different regions, the scales are slightly different. Um, but there are some really key patterns that still that are common across the different regions. We see pretty much this early stability in all of the different regions where coral cover is reasonably high. Admittedly, the uncertainties are quite high also owing to that sparsity and scarcity of data. But we do in almost every region see the impact of the 1998 bleaching event. And it's particularly pronounced in this South Asia region and in the, the top row. The other thing that we're also seeing despite the overall trend is that pretty much every region, except a couple, we're seeing declines, significant declines in coral cover in the last decade. And so we're seeing this either ratcheting down of coral cover without the ability to recover in between major disturbances. Um, and we're seeing the impacts of, of climate change affecting recovery or rates of recovery. So how did we go in terms of impact of the report? This is just a quick summary of the media uptake from the report. And some of these figures are genuinely astounding, I've got to say. The report's been downloaded more than 4,000 times. We had 592 different media articles published across 480 outlets in 62 different countries in 18 languages. The reach is estimated at about two and a half billion people from all of those uh, media related articles. And we included most of the major global um, mastheads. So the New York Times, Washington Post, The Times, The Guardian, Le Monde, Al Jazeera, BBC, the Hindu Time, Hindustan Times, et cetera, et cetera. So we had enormous global media uptake from um, the report, which is absolutely fabulous and a, and a credit to um, those involved, the broader ICRI partnership um, and the media in terms of raising awareness of the plight of coral reefs. We also produced a number of quick animations in order to reinforce the key messages. And Tom, I wonder if you could play the, um, the full length animation for us if I stop sharing my screen.
Thank you, David. Uh, I'm only going to take over now. How can we know the current status, trends and likely futures of our coral reefs with certainty? Prized in 1998, the global average hard coral cover on the world's coral reefs was high and stable. But a single mass coral bleaching event killed 8% of the world's coral. Coral cover recovered during the next decade until a succession of large-scale bleaching events killed 14% of the world's coral. Coral reefs simply hadn't the time between bleaching events to recover. As a consequence, the global average cover of algae on the world's coral reefs has increased by 20%. Algal dominance reduces the ability of corals and the marine life they support to re-establish themselves. It's time to step up our efforts to protect and restore our coral reefs. To help communities, businesses and governments conserve and manage our vital coral reefs, the Global Coral Reef Monitoring Network has released a new report examining the status and trends of the world's coral reefs. Several hundred scientists and organisations contributed to this report which is based on a global data set of almost 2 million observations from over 12,000 sites in 73 countries. Now, in the first global report since 2008, you can discover the status, trends and likely futures of your coral reefs to help you make a positive difference. To learn more and read the report, visit www.gcrmn.net. Thanks, Tom. That's great. So I will go back to sharing my screen, hopefully. So in 90 seconds, um, uh, you got a very, very succinct summary of the major uh, results of the report and far more eloquent than perhaps the last 10 minutes of me talking. We also produced a number of different language versions of a shortened uh, version of that animation to again enhance the uptake of the key results of the report. All of those videos and animations are available for anyone to use um, on the ICRI's YouTube channel, just search for uh, International Coral Reef Initiative. So what did we learn? This is the kind of the crux of the presentation. Um, what we learned was the support for the GCRMN network, despite have not producing a report since 2008, remains extremely strong. We felt that there was enormous value in being able to take this quantitative approach. It gave us the opportunity to, to talk about or make quite strong statements about the global regional and sub-regional trends and status of, of coral reefs. Um, it also gave us the opportunity to really examine the sort of the impacts of large scale disturbances, particularly coral bleaching and, and in the Caribbean, things like coral disease. We also felt that the you saw the media uptake, the strength of that media uptake was in part due to the fact that we delivered some of these key messages through partnerships, particularly with the ICRI Secretariat and UNEP. And we engaged a, a, um, a public relations firm to assist us with getting the messages out to the media, um, crafting some of those key messages and delivering press packages. And that was absolutely money well spent, I think, in retrospect. However, we did also come across a number of challenges. The first and major one is that there's absolutely massive variation in the, in the way we collect coral reef monitoring data around the world. As a consequence of that, we were basically forced into a situation where the only things we could make quantitative or we could analyze quantitatively were hard coral cover and algae. They were essentially the lowest common denominators. They were the two things or the two indicators that the world collects in a sufficiently consistent way that we could integrate into a global um, data set in order to analyze, which means 
disappointingly, we have no, in this report, we have no quantitative analysis of, of fish communities or changes in community composition as a consequence of, of disturbance. And we have very, very few socioeconomic data. These are clear gaps that we want to address going forward. And it was also because of the way we focused the report, particularly at the at the global and regional level, it was more difficult to incorporate information at a local scale. We appreciate that everyone looks for their own home reefs, the reefs they know best when they read a report like this. So I can appreciate that some people would be potentially disappointed in that we didn't go down to that really local, local scale. And of course, like everywhere, COVID presented a number of challenges. The, the way we had designed the delivery of that, this report um, had to change enormously. We were planning to do a whole bunch of regional workshops, some of which we were able to do, um, others we weren't able to do. Um, it, but we were lucky enough that we were able to uh, have a global workshop in, uh, in February of uh, 2020. As COVID was starting to emerge, I thank everyone who um, braved the COVID challenge to get to that uh, particular workshop because that workshop underpinned quite a lot of the, the report. And so we were very fortunate enough to still have that. So what next? Clearly we need to build on the momentum of the report. Coral reefs are in, in the public's mind's eye and we need to capitalize that. We are going to publish an integrated report with an ISBN. You will notice the way the report is accessible on the GCRN website at the moment is by regional, um, by the global chapters or chapter by chapter and then individual regional chapters. Um, I will say uh, for Sandrine's benefit and everyone else's benefit that we received the Caribbean chapter, which is the final chapter of the report on Friday. Uh, I'm currently reviewing that and that will go to the layout. And as soon as that's laid up, um, the whole report will be complete and we will publish that as a single integrated report for everybody. Again, downloadable on the, the GCRMN website. We need to strengthen coordination um, both at regional level and global level. Um, there are some regions where, where you know, there's a variation or a spectrum in, in the strength of the network within different regions and we need to build um, coordination where appropriate. Uh, we're planning to have a steering committee meeting, GCRMN steering committee early in 2022, and we will discuss many of the lessons learned and also things like um, the frequency of this particular report and the design and so forth. We also need to build sustainable funding for, for the GCRMN. We've, we've been very, very lucky through in the last few years with substantial contributions, as I said, from, from DFAT, from Monaco, from UNEP, um, the government of Sweden and other small pots here and there. But we do need um, sustainable funding for, for the broader coordination of, of the GCRMN. We will run a series of workshops um, in coming years. Uh, again, this will prioritise focus for the GCRMN um, in the coming period. And we're now going to, as the plan, ECRI Plan of Action says, we will now turn our focus to building capability and capacity within the, the network. We've produced a report. We'll use the momentum of that report to start building um, capability and capacity. One of the major challenges, as I alluded to earlier, is, is data. We need to tackle data so that our data are more usable, more available, um, more interoperable so that we can integrate them. Our intent is to focus fairly heavily on enhancing data management and access, particularly through partnerships with um, initiatives like Mermaid, the Allen Coral Atlas and, and Reef Cloud. We need to, as I say, introduce standards, um, establish databasing protocols so that we can consolidate data. Um, the, the higher level analytical outputs of the GCRMN report are already being used by WRI and Loretta will talk um, after me. Uh, also in things like the IUCN red listing process and so forth. So there's, there's quite a substantial call 
for at least the modeled outputs of the GCMN um, reports, but there's also substantial calls for the raw data as well. And while we would, and we absolutely would love to share those data, but we can't share the raw data without the permission of the data custodians and data owners. And, and so in every case where raw data is requested, we will point the, those who request it to the data custodians so that they can um, negotiate access. But to encourage that access, we would encourage people to start publishing their data. And this does not only provide greater access, but it also allows greater attribution to the data owners, provides greater transparency for the data that have been incorporated into reports such as this. And it also enhances the reproducibility of the results, which are all um, very, very important things, particularly when we know that these data underpin the management of coral reefs and also investment in coral reef protection and, and restoration. In addition, having access to these data and greater standardised data will allow us to talk about you know, things like changes in benthic composi composition as a consequence of, of bleaching events and the like. We can talk about fish um, communities and in future, we very much would like to incorporate socioeconomic data into these reports so that we're telling the entire story, not just what's happening in a sort of biophysical sense on the reef. And finally, there are a whole range of new technologies um, that are available for coral reef monitoring. And I can tell you from, from a, an Australian perspective that many of these new technologies are circumventing some of the historical challenges of um, you know, requiring to be a, a very good coral taxonomist um, in order to monitor your reefs. Introducing new, these new technologies will allow communities um, and uh, community monitors to monitor coral reefs, thus enhancing the data set we can use going forward. So these are some of the things that we would like to concentrate on going forward. And I think that's it, Jen. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, I think next up, you were going to introduce our friends at the Ministry of the Environment of Japan. I think um, Yohit Mori was up next to speak. Indeed, he was. I was wondering whether there were questions now or you would like to hold them to, to the end. I think probably best to hold them to the end, yeah. Sure, sure. All right, so with that, thanks, Jen. I'd like to introduce uh, Yohei Mori from the Minister, Ministry of Environment in Japan. He is going to talk about the status and trends of the East Asian coral reefs, which were a particularly important region within the, the global coral reef um, report that I just presented. So over to you, uh, Thank you, David. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I would like to share my screen. Hey. Okay, everyone. Um, my name is uh, Yohe Mori, a new officer of Ministry of Environment in charge of coral reef related program. I'd like to share the progress of our regional reports today. Uh, our Moe Japan has been supporting activities of GCRM and East Asia that consist of 14 countries and states. Our support for East Asia is focusing mainly on four aspects, such as a regional workshop, a regional report, a capacity building of individual countries, and collaboration of other regional initiatives, programs, organizations. And uh, on our support for the regional reporting, we would like to announce that the latest report on regional data analysis titled 
status and the trends of East Asian coral reefs. It's almost completed and will be finally launched at the regional workshop on December 21st, next week. For this report, uh, 24,365 transex data of uh, compilers that collected from 1983 to 2019 through the collaborators of 100 individual researchers, institutions, and organizations. I would like to show a little bit of summary of the reports today. The figure shows that y-axis shows percent cover, uh, x-axis shows year data corrected, Red line shows coral cover and green line shows macroalgal cover across years, with individual surveys as points. The overall trend of all the country data shows the lack of clear, lack of clear decline in coral cover from the late 1980s to present day. This could be attributed to an already shifted baseline the averaging of trends across different leaf scales, mitigation by the diversity of leaves in the region, or more likely on interplay among all the above factors. Another finding was this. The figure shows coral cover smoothed by the Bayesian hierarchical generalized additive models of Southeast Asia a year ago, and Northeast Asia, a blue color, across different time points. Coral bleaching was recorded in both Southeast Asia in 1998, 2010, and 2016, coinciding with the El Nino associated global coral bleaching events. However, uh, coral bleaching was more localized and less severe in Northeast Asian sites. Uh, these, are, these are the summary of the recommendation from the regional analysis of the East Asian leaves. It was also recognized that it is very likely more data are available from unidentified sources and non-traditional or non-English sources, especially for general reports, considering the vast diversity of languages used in the region. Translation of these documents and extracting this information to be put into the analysis and the potential database would be ideal for improving the ease of conducting such analysis in the future. It is also still evident that traditional leaf monitoring as described here through surveys remains important, especially if these monitoring efforts are continued through long periods. Some demonstration sites could be considered for assessing regional trend towards 2030. It is suggested that long-term sites are prioritized for the annual monitoring of a select number of representative leaf sites. It also remains to correct the socio-economic monitoring data for assessing the, the situation of leaf management. Socioeconomic and environmental correlation provide insight into how the different factors may affect this trend. The conservation of leaves remains an important consideration for coral leaves to thrive in the future. With the data and analysis shown here, it is evident that research into leaf needs to continue and guide management decisions. After editing the regional report 2020, uh, there are major challenges for the next steps. As well as regional status and trends, we have national chapters including leaf trends and recommendations for each country. To highlight and share this finding of national level, we will organize a regional workshop on December 21st. We will also send out print reports to each member country after the workshop. To enhance long-term monitoring, capacity building for some countries, and 
standardized monitoring at demonstration sites will be the next challenges in the regions. To enhance brief monitoring and management until 2030, the Japanese government supports coral restoration project in Mauritius and coral management project in Palau through Japan International Cooperation Agency projects. These projects would enhance national capacities and provide case studies of reef management. It will also be another challenge to improve regional mechanism to prepare regional analysis for the next decade. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Yohei. That is uh, excellent. Um, I would now like to introduce uh, Dr. Serge Plan from Kriob. Um, Serge is going to talk about uh, GCRN monitoring analysis at national level. Uh, Serge made a major contribution to the delivery of the, the global report. Uh, and for that, I thank him and uh, also Jeremy Vicart, one of Serge's PhD students who primarily led the data integration. So many of the things that, that Serge will talk about now come out of the lessons learned from that. So over to you, Serge. Thank you, David. So I'm gonna start sharing my screen. Uh, that should work, I believe. And I believe you should see my screen now. So thank you, David. And, um, and uh, uh, so my name is Serge Plan, as David said, and I'm working as a research scientist at the CNRS and I'm working jointly with the Ministry for Ecological Transition in France. And part of the work that has been done is actually uh, promoted by the French Ministry. And Antoine is there, can acknowledge that as well. As somewhere. So I wanted to, to, to present briefly actually what is uh, what we have learned in terms of how much we can say from the data we collected and what were the limitations. So I'm not going to talk about that slide at all because David presented completely uh, and in detail all the recent JSRM consortium and how um, this report sort of reflect um, the global decline, the resilience, and what type of data uh, we, we collected. Um, the intention in this in this report that we're going to be launching very soon uh, through the ICRI is actually to evaluate it, uh, the um, how much the data that we're collecting the feed reflect the the situation regarding the coral reef community so the intention here is to provide an insight from the data compiled within the JCRN, so exactly the same data that david presented to provide at the national level so taking the first first 30 countries in the world with the highest um, percent uh, uh, coral cover and to have an idea of uh, assessing how much those data uh, do uh, represent uh, geographically or spatially the the, um, the situation and how much we can provide from the data uh, in terms of statue considering the um, considering the the key uh, uh, parameters that were identified as ICRI recommendation indicator for those 30 countries. So it's basically to see what we can say really regarding ICRI recommendation indicator based on the data that we have and what is lacking. And so you can see that uh, there is different indicator that were provided by ICRI, which are live coral cover, which has fleshy algae cover, uh, which are fish abundance and diversity that are that are indicated that actually gives the information about the state of the of the of the coral reef by themselves, not necessarily looking at the trends, but really the state themselves. Uh, so the the methods that we've used is actually on um, two sort of direction. One is to evaluate uh, the the data in terms of how much they're, they're characterizing the spatial and temporal spatial scale, how much the identification of method use, how much those methods varied, and the characterization to the taxonomic resolution of the data. And I will come to that, that aspect just after. The second aspect was to use an iteration and the decision tree-based approach to see how much we can indicate 
in the end gives whether those indicators are available, are not available, are unknown, and what kind of statue we can provide for the equi in terms of recommendation for those indicator uh, based on, uh, of course, um, the information we have on taxonomy. Uh, precision information about all those those sort of information so as an example here you've got an example uh, not that i want to be biased by the country where i live but i'll give you an example of the french territories it's actually one of the most complicated one because as you can see on the map there's territories everywhere in the world which doesn't make that actually country the, the simplest one to 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 look at and so you can see immediately from the different point and the different uh collectivities that, that France sort of um, uh, administrated in the world that the different location of where we have uh, uh, data, we can see that there's data a little bit everywhere, but that already gives an idea about how much the spreading in terms of spatial spreading, those data are in the territories. The next step is actually to see how much uh, those data were collected for years. So you got here an example of the number of uh, uh, that I collected uh, uh, for three years. You can see that pre-1990, 1990, actually, there's almost nothing. And it's really starting at after the, the, the major bleaching M998 and after 2000, that's really there's data collected. You, you, you got the information about the type of data that are collected, the way they're collected, um, uh, whether it's a photo quadrat, whether it's LIT, PIT, or different techniques, basically. You can see that line intersect transect and point intersect transect are clearly the one that are mostly used. You can see about uh, on term of uh, percentage through time, how much different methods are used. You, you can see that, for example, um, there's, there's actually been a slight shift uh, between LIT and PIT through times according to three different year, year, year um, uh, to, to three ten, uh, periods of period of time. We can have an idea about how much uh, we have in terms of um, identification of the um, of the, the different taxonomic level and how much the proportion uh, of those 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 information is provided. You can see that some uh, that are providing very in deep uh, detail about the different. Uh, taxonomic levels, some of course are, are, are quite limited in that. So that's an example of uh, how, how the data that we have from the French uh, uh, coral reef uh, we know. And from that, then we can have an information about whether the living coral cover is a special, uh, whether the, the information regarding the special extent is good or uh, uh, is available or not available, whether the temporal extent gives is available or not available, whether the monitoring methods are available, not available, whether the taxonomic resolution are available, not available. You can see, for example, here for the French territories or for the live coral cover, we pretty have a good view of at the for the live coral cover of the spatial extent, temporal extent, monitoring methods, taxonomic resolu uh, resolution. Same thing for the fleshy algae cover, for which we, we have also a good resolution clearly, and this is actually what David was mentioning for the fish abundance and biomass at that stage. We do have the data, but the compilation of those data are clearly lacking and we have, are unknown really about whatever we can sort of commit to give an idea about how much uh, uh, those indicators related to, to fish abundance and biomass can be provided. So, so that that's, is the idea. And then most important is actually the synthesis for those 20, 30 countries. So to me, this is actually the most important uh, uh, slide really on, the, on that analysis is to look at over the first, the 30 pilot country is that where we are in, ter in terms of um, uh, regarding live, live coral cover or fresh algal cover, where we are in terms of uh, uh, spatial extent, temporal extent, monitoring methods, taxonomic resolution. We can see that for a live coral cover, we've got available, available yeah, the, we, ha we have an available information for 21 out of the 30, 30 country. And clearly the, the limiting factor is the spatial extent, which really limits in most of the time, the, the interpretation we can, we can see. We can see that 
regarding regarding taxonomic resolution it's actually fairly poor also in most of the time so that that's that's uh, also an aspect that is that is uh, problematic into being able then to to deliver uh, uh, the information in terms of the equi recommended indicators uh, for regarding the, the the algae we can see that we have an availability of only 13 out of the 30 country so and again here we have limitation on the spatial scale and on the taxonomic resolution so both uh, here are also lacking and so this is highlighting in some ways where are the limits we have from the data presently available uh, in terms of providing then uh, um, um, a good sense of the equi recommended recommended indicator for uh, uh, for uh, uh, for then uh, providing recommendation. Um, I would like to say, and because time is running, that uh, the future targets to improve the monitoring uh, of coral reef is clearly, and that's what something um, already uh, David mentioned, is the heterogeneity of the monitoring. Uh, and that is often the main obstacle to to being able to uh, give a final vision and a global vision of the situation. There's been a lot of different methods. There have been a lot of different level of taxonomic resolution. That, that's clearly limiting. And so we are um, uh, clearly uh, um, advocating for some, uh, some, some aspect or some recommendation that will come for sure in the next meeting we will have is that to, of course, continue the centralization of the data. That is something that is very important. So is to maintain the engagement of the community to actually centralize the data in one place. And of course, making sure that everybody get benefits actually on, on that centralization. It's to try to centralize uh, the monitoring protocol, maybe in the, in the futures to ad adapt those protocol to the equi recommendator recommended indicator for the pure future protocol. This is also essential. Uh, I know that some protocol may be very good, maybe very highlighting some aspect for science, but since Jesse Raman is mainly here to actually um, give information for uh, uh, and recommendation for management, and we, we need to sort of uh, adjust those, those, the, those data to what is requested for in terms of um, indicator. Uh, we certainly would like to more and more prefer the use of image-based methods, mainly because you can come back after on it if you haven't done it properly or if you find new things to analyze, so you can come back on that. And of course, there will be, uh, uh, it will be important to uh, increase the taxonomic resolution or at least to define an, 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 um, an, uh, a sort of... Um, uh, an objective and uh, common use of the different taxonomic level, especially when it comes to uh, uh, anything that is actually not coral or when it comes to coral, but to uh, most family level or some of those aspects. So, so I would say that we, we are in the first step for, uh, for uh, JCRMN to start integrating uh, quantitative data, but then we are seeing also the limits of this integration and so we, we, it will be important to, to in the future to, to dedicate it, then define actually those, those methods according to what we want. And, and what we want is firstly to, to reach uh, the uh, indicator that are uh, uh, recommended by ECRI in the future protocol. And that will be the main, the main axis of, and the way of thinking for the new, or not, I would say the new for the, changes in monitoring uh, protocol that we would, we would propose in the future. Thank you very much for that. Thank you very much, Serge. Um, excellent insights from uh, the broader GCRMN data acquisition process um, that you and Jeremy did a massive amount to do. Um, I would now like to introduce Loretta Burke from the World Resources Institute. Um, Loretta has been a long time supporter of the GCRMN and for that we are absolutely grateful. Uh, she managed to produce a range of very excellent dashboards uh, despite our 
rather sporadic delivery of chapters from time to time. Um, so top marks to you, Loretta. Uh, I'm very keen to see what, uh, what you've got to say. So over to you. Thank you much, David. Is my screen being shared yet? It is, but not in presenter mode. Okay. There we go. Okay, thank Perfect. you. Thanks, David. And thanks everyone for still being with this session. Uh, and thanks for the opportunity to present during the GCRM session. I'm Loretta Burke, I'm with the World Resources Institute based in Washington, DC. And I'm going to share some coral reef dashboards for the 10 GCRM regions. I'm going to do a short update on our global coral reef profile, which I originally shared with GCRMN back in February, then uh, share some how you access the, uh, the dashboards and what their contents are, and then briefly share a proposal to do an update of an analysis of social and economic vulnerability to coral degradation. The dashboards were funded by UNEP, GEF, and Swedish CETA. Just a little bit on how this came about. Back in 2018, I was confronted with a variety of anecdotal reports, papers, and presentations about how the coral reefs around the world were doing, and was struck by the divergence of um, opinion. And some very positive reports, which made me say, really? I um, then reached out to a number of colleagues and had conversations, particularly with Helen Fox, about what could we possibly do to, um, you know, have something that's live in between GCRMN reports. So we came up with the concept of a data hub. And the early work on this was funded by National Geographic, WRI, TNC, National Geographic, and Vulcan uh, teamed up to do interviews and surveys of four different audiences that make decisions relevant to coral reefs to see what data and information they most need to support those decisions. This resulted in what we're calling a data hub. Oops. So um, about 30 different global data sets have been loaded on the Resource Watch platform um, from about two dozen different data sources. And they basically cover pressure on coral reefs, uh, protection of coral reefs, values, and now some on status of coral reefs. This was the basis for the coral reef, global coral reef profile, which we then developed, which is really a bit of a primer on coral reefs. It is a mix of indicators and maps and narrative that tells the story of pressure state response resilience on coral reefs. Uh, covers all of these topics and um, is sort of an executive summary, an interactive executive summary on coral reefs. And I presented this, as I said, back in February, so I'll just give the update to say some improvements on the coral reef profile. It's lengthy and it needed some navigation. So we've introduced um, a clickable table of contents that allows you to jump to the different sections on value, local threats, global threats, condition, management, resilience, and key resources. We also have uh, navigation tools at the top as you're navigating through the profile. And we've now, thanks to GCRMN, been able to integrate um, the indicators at the global level for live hard coral cover and algae and done extracts from the report to summarize those indicators. But onto the dashboards. Now, I was trying to get rid of this thing at the top. Um, this is how you access the dashboards and then you click on the region of interest below the map. As for dashboard contents, um, it's divided into four sections, each dashboard. One on importance and value, one on habitat and protection, threats to coral reefs and coral condition. And for each, there are indicators summarizing different aspects of that topic for the region. 
But then for most, there are maps where you can dive deeper, zoom around, go to your country or local area of interest to learn more about the, uh, the values, the protection, the threats, etc. So I boldly now switch to a live demo. And let me know if this is working okay. This is the dashboard for the Western Indian Ocean. And with each dashboard, we begin with a description of the extent and then a summary of reef dependent population, which are S for 2020, which we calculated for these products. Then we look at tourism um, from mapping ocean wealth. So which is, the summary is divided into on reef recreation and reef adjacent benefits. And for any indicator in this dashboard, you can click on the I and find background information and links. I neglected to reload the dashboard. Um, I'm gonna do a quick refresh to make, no, I can't. Okay, so I'm going to zoom out. Better yet, a quick starting fresh. Okay, I'll just zoom down. So after seeing the, the indicator for tourism, you can then see maps of tourism value for the region. And you can switch to different values. Coral reef fisheries, shoreline protection values. And by the way, Mark Spaulding and I are working on updates to the coral reef fisheries and uh, shoreline protection values currently. We can then look at social and economic vulnerability to reef degradation. Air, um, countries mapped in red are the most vulnerable, and that's based on reef dependence. High dependence countries are in red, and adaptive capacity. Low adaptive capacity countries are in red. Moving along. We look at coral reef area by country using both WCMC and the GCRMN numbers, which are quite different, but fortunately the percentage of the globe's reefs are quite similar. We use the UNEP WCMC data to overlay with um, protected areas to see the percentage in protected areas, but also for those in no take or highly protected areas from uh, MPA Atlas. And once again, we see the sources and links to those sources here. We have mangrove loss and gain over the last 20 years from Global Mangrove Watch. And looking at protection, we have the map of mangroves and coral reefs, and then both protected areas and highly protected areas. So can find which area we're looking at with a click. And then in looking at threats, we have uh, local threats to coral reefs from reefs at risk. We have projections of the frequency of coral bleaching by decade from NOAA's Coral Reef Watch at four kilometer resolution and also acidification projections. Um, when are reefs likely to enter into marginal or poor states also? from Coral Reef Watch. And we have all of these both local and global threat data um, within this map. So you can add whatever you want to look at, for instance, total suspended solids, uh, total suspended matter, um, shipping lanes, or in looking at the global threats, I'll just add one ocean acidification. And one of the things I like about this particular data layer is there's a slider. So you can look at projections of the suitability of areas for coral growth. 
by decade. And finally, we've added um, the coral condition information from GCRMN. And we always use the same scale, so you can easily, easily compare live coral cover to algal cover across. And you can touch these, um, get the statistics and confidence intervals. Of course, the sources are listed. And from each chapter, I've done a very short summary of um, the GCRM and findings for the two condition indicators. In the case of the Western Indian Ocean, I also did a short summary from the regional report from 2017, and then wrap it up with a summary that combines the indicators used in this dashboard and the GCRMN results. Just um, a final couple slides. Um, I wanted to talk about the social economic um, vulnerability to reef degradation and loss, which was done as part of Reefs at Risk in 2011. So it's quite outdated. Um, it was widely used, but is quite outdated. And it, it combines indicators on reef dependence, adaptive capacity, and exposure, or you know, likelihood of degradation. The component indicators for reef dependence are seven categories, one or two data inputs under each. And for adaptive capacity, you know, similarly, it's six indicator categories. So for instance, it's you know, GDP and remittances, literacy and education, um, corruption, alternative livelihoods. And for the exposure likelihood of degradation, it was from the Reefs at Risk Integrated Local Threat Index. And the thing I wanna point out is when we did this back in 2011, about a third of the indicators we used were routinely updated data sources like FAO or UNEP. About a third were modeled in a GIS, and then a third were painstakingly compiled for, this, for that analysis. So not easily replicable. So what we'd like to do is update this and make it more replicable. We would want to do that by first engaging in a consultative process um, to get input on indicators desired and recommend recommendations on data sources. We would then design the index with a focus on indicators that are routinely compiled and updated, identify the best data sources and develop metrics to fill in any gaps, really significant gaps. For threat or hazard, we would want to update our threat mapping with newer knowledge, in particular GCRMN results, but also include projections of warming and acidification. Share that for review, ultimately update the indicators and metadata, share all of the products, and along the way, develop a communication strategy for developing um, products that will have wide outreach. I plan on revising a concept note for this later this month. And I welcome your feedback on everything I've covered, anything I've covered, um, the dashboards, the coral reef profile, and the idea of doing an update to the social and economic vulnerability indicators. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Loretta, and everybody else who presented. I believe we've got a little bit of time for some questions. And I think, um, Sandrine, maybe you had a, a observation or a question that you wanted to um, ask David. Uh, yes, thank you, Jennifer, uh, with pleasure. But maybe some countries would like to, to take the floor first. I think when while folks are formulating their questions, you can go ahead, Sandrine. Okay, so I I try to turn my camera on just briefly because I have a connection that is not very um, strong. So, just um, uh, first, I, I would like to to thank uh, to, really to acknowledge and to uh, thank everybody that uh, worked connected to that uh, to that report. It was a uh, very interesting experience and uh, in particular thank, thank you David for 
for everything and, and in especially the very good restitution you made today um, including reporting the the challenge and uh, the future improvement uh, that we we need to take into consideration for for the next one um, oh yes, I forgot to say, um, I'm Sandrine Piva, the director of SPRAC, a regional activity center of uh, the Cartagena Convention, but uh, I'm speaking as um, the GCRM node coordinator. And uh, speaking for, the, for them, we indeed call for a more integrated and holistic approach for the next report. Uh, well, he joined all the comments already made, uh, integrating fish, integrating uh, socioeconomic uh, data. That's extremely important to, to really have a real view of, uh, of a situation. Uh, regarding the Caribbean in particular, we had no big or nice surprise. Uh, it confirms the, what we could get, uh, we, what we knew from other exploitation of um, heavy uh, coastal development from of also the hurricane and blanching we we experience but uh, we just like to to bring to your attention uh, a few ideas you you uh, that could be uh, Dev, uh, that could make resolution or at least uh, recommendation as, uh, for instance, reducing runoff and, um, as, and um, ch ship discharge, work on uh, the question of ballast water. Also, um, sorry, also um, try to not try, uh, ban the use of uh, destructive fishing gears and uh, work also on uh, the herbivore, herbivore fish and uh, herbivore um, over herbivores. In particular, I, I agree had, uh, has already made a very good resolution regarding parrot fish, and uh, we, of course, try to to promote it and uh, would like it to, to be followed on, um, on, uh, for reducing parrot fish fishing and uh, globally enhance biodiversity and resiliency. So, as you said, the, the coral can be more resilient, resilient to all the, the challenges they met. And uh, again, thank you. We, last thing, we cannot start early enough for the next report, and you can count on us for, for this. Thank you. Thank you, Sandrine. And it appears next are colleagues from Japan. I think it's IG Tanaka. You have a comment or question for us? Uh, Thank you, Madam Chair. So can you hear me? Yes. Oh, okay. So, uh, thank you, uh, all presented presenters, uh, for your presentation, uh, for their presentation. It's very informative. So I have one comment on the world report. So, I believe it's very important to show the results of the this GCRM World Report on uh, coral reef loss and uh, uh, climate change impacts to, uh, to wider audiences, including the CBD negotiators and the UNFCCC ones. So it's a pity that the CBD Geneva meeting was postponed, but uh, it is still is a good idea to hold a side event at the future CBD meeting and share the global coral reef trend. That's my comment. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any other questions or comments? I think I just, uh, Alfred, there I just saw your hand. I, yeah, thank you. So first of all, thank you to all the presenters and congratulations on the spectacular reports and dashboards and other platforms that have been produced. You know, I think um, we, there was a lot of work to be done in terms of standardization and all that, but I think it's really great that the uh, ICRIT community has really leaned into the uh, the different tools available. Oops, uh, sorry.
sorry about that. I just need to uh, take care of something that happened um, in my house. I'm sharing a laugh with Alfred because I have a very hungry cat who started to howl at my feet. So <laughs> apologies if you hear her. Francis, did you have something for us? No, no, I, I just wanted to, to, to mention a couple of things regarding the previous comments from Japan. So the, the first one is, an, and David Souter, our colleague from uh, UK, can speak more about this, but during the latest uh, UN uh, COP, 26 in Glasgow, they organized a side event and David Souter made a presentation about the status of the, the report, the TCMN report. From what I've heard, this was one of the events was, was the most watched it online. So I think uh, it was a good publicity for the report. And the other thing is uh, next year, we're also planning to organize several uh, regional uh, webinar to provide the result at the regional level for regional policymakers. So, so we, we are planning to do this in the coming months. Thank you. Hi, sorry, just to jump back in. I'm sorry, I'm cat sitting and there was a, a bit of a tumble over there. Um, no, but it's really wonderful just to see the cooperation among the ICRI community around uh, further standardizing and identifying those indicators that are really valuable at global scales because we can use them as Tanakh and others have uh, expressed uh, towards building a really robust and thorough global uh, biodiversity monitoring framework. And the more we can institutionalize these, these indicators, I think the better chance we'll have at driving different types of support, um, whether it's at the, the national level, the subnational level, or the multilateral level um, for, for monitoring efforts in the future. Um, sorry again about all the chaos. Thanks. No problem. Thank you for your comments. Did we have any other comments? or questions. Yeah. Okay, well, we are right on time. Um, I think with that, um, I'll make a few comments and we'll close out the, um, the meeting for today. Um, so hopefully, as Chris said, tomorrow you may be able to meet Monica Medina, who's the State Department's Assistant Secretary for Oceans and International Environmental Scientific Affairs. We look forward to, to seeing her. Um, we welcomed three new members to our ICRI family. So congratulations, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, the Commonwealth Secretariat, and the Gulf and Caribbean Fisheries Institute. Great to have you all aboard. Um, you heard about the framework for action which is our plan of action. And we look forward to working with you to add more details and change the um, illustrative actions to the actions we, we will agree to undertake um, during US hosting ICRI. Um, David Souter presented the latest GCRMN report with an interesting presentation on East Asian corals afterwards, and then Serge doing a bit of a deeper dive to comment on monitoring at the national level. And then Loretta concluded things with a really uh, impressive look at the recent dashboards that have been developed. So with that, we will see you in two days. The link will be different. Um, so it won't be the same link from today. Um, and in the meantime, we encourage participants to look at the motion, um, the post-2020 motion, and the terms of reference for the resilience-based management and restoration ad hoc working groups. Um, and if there are no other closing comments, Francis or Chris, I think we can adjourn for the day. All right, take care everyone and we'll see you in a couple of days. Thank you. Thank you. See you soon. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Jen. Thanks, Christine. Thank you. Thank you. All right. All right. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.